Hello, I'm Yvette Torres. Thank you for joining us today as we talk about overcoming stigma and ending discrimination. We begin our four-part webinar series, The Power of Perceptions and Understanding, Changing How We Deliver Treatment and Recovery Services by discussing how we can overcome stigma and end discrimination in order to enhance the effectiveness of our responses to substance related problems and conditions. Substance use disorders are one of the most prevalent, debilitating, and costly health conditions in the world, and also one of the most highly stigmatized. Barriers of stigma and discrimination can prevent and delay people from seeking help for these problems, as well as undermine recovery efforts, resulting in greater overall health and social harms. This webcast will focus on the need to shift away from the use of negative concepts as organizing paradigms to address socially discrediting health problems, like substance use disorders. We will explore how stigma perpetuates negative perceptions and biases towards individuals suffering from substance use disorder and what courses of actions we can take to decrease stigma and biases. Today, we are joined by Dr. Ken Leonard, who is the director of the Research Institute on Addictions at the New York State University at Buffalo and research professor in psychiatry at the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. Dr. Leonard's research has focused on the reciprocal influences of interpersonal and familial processes and substance use. His current research examines predictors of treatment entry among patients with a heroin overdose after release from the hospital, as well as research on the barriers to buprenorphine prescribing in primary care. Dr. John Kelly is the Elizabeth R. Spalling Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, the first endowed professorship in addiction medicine at Harvard. At the Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. Kelly serves as the director of the Recovery Research Institute, the program director of the Addiction Recovery Management Service, and the associate director of the Center for Addiction Medicine. His clinical and research work focuses on addiction treatment and the recovery process, mechanisms of behavior change, and stigma and discrimination towards individuals suffering from addiction. Dr. Corey Vilsant, a community psychologist and research fellow at the Harvard Medical School and the Massachusetts General Hospital Recovery Research Institute and the Center for Addiction Medicine. Her research focuses on racial health disparities in remission and recovery from addiction. Michael Botticelli, is the executive director of the Graken Center for Addiction at Boston Medical Center and a distinguished policy scholar at the Johns Hopkins Bloomer School of Public Health in Baltimore. In 2012, he joined the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, ONDCP, as deputy director. He was the first person in recovery from a substance use disorder and also the first person with a public health background to serve in that post as acting director. Prior to joining ONDCP, he served as director of the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Welcome to you all. Great to have Thank you here you. today. John, let's start with you. Um, let's start with really defining stigma and discrimination as it pertains to substance use disorders. Can you please define these two elements? Sure. We can think of stigma as a, an attribute, behavior, or condition that is socially discrediting. And discrimination is really unjust or unfair treatment of people who have that uh, stigmatized condition. And um, the reason, of course, why we're talking about this is that uh, stigma and discrimination occur right across mental health but actually very specifically, more specifically, and uh, uh, more intensively with addiction and substance use disorders. We know that, uh, as was alluded to in your introduction, um, is that people feel that stigma, that's that fear and shame uh, associated with substance use disorders, and that actually prevents self 
acknowledgement of a disorder or a problem, self-disclosure, and accepting help and seeking help. So this can uh, undermine uh, efforts to, to, to seek help, to seek help sooner, uh, as well as undermine recovery efforts. And it's interesting, uh, when we think about stigmatized conditions, including all mental health conditions, and, and look at the degree of stigma, I think we all know here, and probably our viewers know, that substance use disorders and psychiatric conditions are very stigmatized. But just how stigmatized, perhaps they don't know. Uh, there was a study conducted by the World Health Organization which looked at uh, 18 of the most stigmatized conditions across 14 different countries. And what they found was when they surveyed people in those 14 different countries, and, the, and these 18 highly stigmatized uh, problems or conditions included things like being HIV positive, being a criminal, as well as having an illicit drug addiction, as well as an alcohol addiction. So there were different types of problems, um, but some very stigmatized ones. And they ranked them, they were asked to rank them in, in order of, uh, you know, um, social distance and fear and, and stigma mm -hmm. and so on. And what they found was that um, those uh, across, uniformly across all of these different uh, countries and conditions, number one, illicit drug addiction was the most stigmatized. Number four in the list of 18, alcohol addiction. So we are talking about very highly stigmatized uh, conditions in, in society which can lead, not always, but can lead to discrimination, in other words, unfair, unjust practices which can prevent people from, from getting a job, from getting housing, even opening a bank account. And those um, are the macro ways yes. in which it affects Yes, there can be structural, structural discrimination, as you know, macro discrimination as well as um, micro discrimination. So there's kind of violations of persons' rights uh, versus kind of uh, personal slights uh, that people might experience. Very good, Joan, thank you. Corey, let's now talk about ways in which discrimination manifests itself for individuals that, are, um, that have a substance use disorder and those that are in recovery from a substance use disorder. Sure, you know, talking about what Dr. Kelly said, talked about with the macro discriminations often occur on a structural level. And so that's when you actually have a network of policies or practices that serve to disenfranchise an entire group. Um, you can also experience micro discriminations. And these are more subtle. They can be verbal, nonverbal events, uh, like a snub or an insult. And uh, they're often more common than the macro discriminations as well. Uh, but uh, these are some of the experiences that people have when uh, having a substance use disorder or in recovery as well. Very good. Um, Michael, you're in recovery. Mm -hmm. Have you ever experienced these conditions? Um, I have, and on a very personal note, like I, I, I uh, profoundly remember um, knowing that I needed help, that I had a problem. But as Dr. Kelly talked about, um, I, I really avoided care-seeking behavior. Like, I didn't want to ask for help because I was really afraid what people would think about me personally. I was tremendously afraid of what it impact my employment. I was working for a pretty prestigious academic institution at the time. Didn't know how, uh, that. I didn't know what my family was going to think. Clearly, I kind of put off seeking help until, unfortunately, like many people, uh, it wasn't until an intersection with the criminal justice system that uh, gave me some leverage. Uh, to get care and we you know I've often said that my story is not unique we see that playing out millions upon millions of times that you know if you look at kind of uh, of the small percent of people who get treatment one of the biggest referral sources is the criminal justice system and and I think it's indicative of that people uh, we do a bad job of diagnosing within our healthcare system but but because of that care avoidance, I think it's often in, uh, that people reach a very acute stage, and it's often their intersection with the law enforcement system uh, that we engage issues. And I just want to say one other thing. And when we talk about structural issues, you know, if you look at the history of federal drug control spending for a very long period of time, it was focused on law enforcement responses. And I think it's a reflection that we thought this were bad people who were doing bad things. Um, and, and, and I think it's only been recently, uh, until the end of the Obama administration, uh, where we finally saw public health spending uh, actually equal some of our law enforcement spending. So, you know, it, it really does have, I think, our, our perceptions of people directly play into discriminatory public policy. Very good. Ken, 
we've heard about the definition, the micro, the macro, but let's take it to the family. Are there instances where we see stigma and discrimination within the context of family? Absolutely, and, and, and I think the, a lot of the things that were described at the macro level and the micro level happen in the family as well. So to start with the, the idea that um, there, there is sometimes there's almost a caricature of a person who has an addiction. And the um, family um, doesn't see that in the person who's, who has a, a problem with a, a substance. Um, so as a result, it delays identification. And, and a lot of what we think of as denial can, can really be fit into this notion that um, a person doesn't seem to fit with what people have characterized as the characteristics of a person with that, with that problem. Um, you also see that, that same level of, of then um, shame in the family in terms of, of wanting to bring this to, to the public, to bring it to a, a professional. Um, and, and then you see the same thing on the recovery end where there's often uh, a fear of being remaining involved with that person because of, of the shame and, and the, the, the fear that there might be a relapse. But we know that them remaining in contact and remaining um, um, a, a source of support for that person is critical to their recovery. Very good. Anything else? Oh, I just wanted to add something that Michael brought up because I think it's very important from a, when, we, when we look at the last 50 years of drug policy in the United States, for example, since the war on drugs was declared, we've come a long way. And I think one of the reasons why we've seen this shift towards a public health model, as Michael pointed out, is that there is the recognition of the nature of substance use disorders. I think we know much more clearly now exactly what they are, how they affect the brain and how genetics play a role in terms of cause. Because if you think about the topic that we're talking about today, which is stigma and discrimination, um, uh, we, we tend to feel, you know, I think stigma and discrimination are related to two factors which influence the degree of stigma attributable to us any condition. One is cause and the other one is controllability. We tend to have more sympathy and compassion if we can say, well, they can't help it and they didn't cause it. Mm -hmm. But with substance use disorders, there's a disconnect there because we say, well, wait a minute, they did choose to pick up that drink or drug um, and they can control it. Um, if they really wanted to, they could. So th this is the kind of the common misperception of substance use disorders that can lead to attributions of, 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 of bias and stigma. Mm -hmm. And what we have learned, both in terms of genetics and neuroscience regarding cause and controllability, is regarding cause, yes, people do have to make that initial decision. But like many other diseases and disorders, it is an interaction between genes and environment. So you don't get to choose how you respond to that initial exposure. And genetics modulate or, or moderate that degree of uh, impact. So some people actually uh, will respond in a very um, positive way to initial exposure to a substance. They will love it. They will love that experience. That's not their choice, the degree of uh, experience, you know, how they experience it subjectively. Other people will, will, will kind of take it or leave it. It's not, and actually some people find it aversive. The exact same exposure, aversive. Some people can't get enough of it. And regarding controllability, so that's to do with cause. Our genetics modulate the degree to which we experience and how we experience uh, exposure to those particular substances. Um, and in terms of controllability, what we've learned in, in, the, in neuroscience in the last 30 years through fantastic imaging studies is just the degree of impact that it has on the structure and function of the brain. And this is where controllability comes in. One of the defining features of addiction, of course, is, is impaired control despite very severe consequences. Mm -hmm. So why yes. is that? You know, why would an organism that has a propensity for 80 years of life, you know, that has uh, Mother Nature is endowed with a propensity for 80 years of life, self-destruct, poison itself to death roughly 30 to 40 years prior to the normal expiration date? Why would that happen? That's not a matter of choice. That, I would argue that is not a matter of choice. And when you see the brain images, both structural and functional brain images, now which we're, we're able to see very clearly, you can see clearly how the structure of the brain is dramatically affected in a dose-response fashion. So that helps us, I think, understand more clearly now why we're, mo why we're moving, as Michael said, and under Michael's direction, you know, towards a uh, public health 
more of a public health approach as opposed to a criminal justice approach. I think that's very important when it comes to stigma and discrimination. And I think those are the type of observations that really do help even the patients themselves mm -hmm. understand their ability to cope yeah. with their shame. I think so. And their ability to want to seek treatment uh, as well. Um, Ken, let's talk about uh, the disease of addiction as John has mentioned, is one of the most stigmatized conditions in the world. Why is that? Well, I think John just laid out the case. It, it is the fact that, it, that <coughs> on the surface it looks as though the person caused it themselves and that it's controllable. And, and so in contrast to, say, heart disease, you know, where it seems to develop sort of invisibly, um, people don't necessarily attribute any causality to the person and they don't see that they chose it. Now, we understand that there are contributors that people do in terms of their diet and their exercise that, that have an impact. And my guess is that, that people's view of that may change over time. But with regard to addictions, it's very clear that there's this expectation that because you chose that first step, that then you choose the additional steps. And, you know, one of the, the people in the Buffalo area has often said, you know, you don't, you don't choose to be an addict. You know, that is that is not a choice you make. You, you may make well, that initial. Well, this is one of the next questions. Yeah. It was, how are discriminatory perceptions harmful to individuals experiencing substance use disorders? And is, is the fact that you really don't choose? You don't, you don't choose. And, and the, the as, as John laid out, the causality is, um, and not only is it what happens with regard to the brain, but it's with regard to everybody around you and how they react to you. And, and there's a variety of things that sort of perpetuate that. You lose friends that are uh, tied to you who don't use drugs. Those can be a really important factor. You, you uh, develop this social network. Um, a lot of times your partner is a, is a substance user as well. And so what you have is something that's, that's more than just a brain disease, but it's, it's an entire systemic disorder that envelops the brain and the psychological factors and social factors as well. So John, are these barriers uh, to treatment, they obviously are uh, mm -hmm. barriers to treatment um, and recovery, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, as, we, as we've talked about, mentioned, is that because of the, the fear of disclosure and being found out one's been using drugs or alcohol heavily, et cetera, um, that can lead to secrecy. Secrecy, isolation, more and more, especially with families. You know, families can become so insular I'm and glad, insulated. I'm glad, yeah. I'm glad you bring the families up because that, that's something I know that Ken, you studied. So yeah. go ahead and maybe we well, can have yeah. uh, Ken add, yeah. expand on that. Well, Ken knows better than anybody because he studied this the most, um, that uh, families become insulated. They become insular they close themselves off because they don't, the shame in the family is very big. They don't want to admit it. They're in denial. They, they would rather sweep it under the carpet, not acknowledge it, attribute it to some other thing, that they'll grow out of it or they're going to change. Or, um, just because the stigma and shame and fear in our society is so great. Now, it is changing, but it, it, it is definitely there and it's pervasive. And so it's this sense of uh, non-disclosure, uh, fear driven by fear and shame, uh, not acknowledging it and not acknowledging it soon enough, which leads to premature mortality, disease, and all the other consequences that we see that can be avoided if we can address these issues of uh, stigma and discrimination. Uh, Ken, clearly, um, can you take us through a micro look at, at the family and how those dynamics play out? So, um, to, to some extent I can, but, but in, Every family is a little bit different in the way these things unfold. And, and um, so one of the things that we know is that um, if, you, if you take a look at, say, just at the couple level, that it's very common that the couples have similar characteristics and that those characteristics um, reinforce the couple. So what we see is, is that um, if we have a, a, a man who's a heavy drinker, it's very common that he's married to a woman who's a heavy drinker. And as a result, um, if one of them tries to change, there is chaos in the family. There may be chaos in the family if both of them are, are heavy drinkers, but um, we know that the, they tend to be more stable, that they tend to be happier if they both are heavier drinkers. And, and that 
is bad for the rest of the family, but that social structure is very, very stable for them, and they have lower divorce rates than couples where only one of them is a heavy drinker. So one of the dynamics is, is that couples tend to reinforce each other around this behavior until something intervenes. And so that can be the criminal justice system, that could be um, the arrival of a child. The, the, it's, a, it's a difference, different structure, I think, when you have a, a, a couple where they're, they're dealing with a teenager who's beginning to use substances, and I, and I think that that dynamic is completely different. Corey, I'm going to go to you because your research is on, on health disparities. Mm -hmm. how, how do um, these disparities, racial and, and health disparities, um, uh, manifest themselves within the context of what we're speaking about in terms of discrimination and, and stigma? Yeah, sure. So, you know, as we already covered, the, so the role of criminal justice um, intersects commonly with substance use disorders. We also know that the criminal justice system sometimes can be disproportionately applied to different racial and ethnic groups, um, despite having equivalent prevalent levels of a substance use disorder. And that's when you start to see that perhaps when you uh, have an encounter with the law, lose your right to vote, um, although maybe one group, one racial group versus the other is using the substance at about the same rate, one group seems to suffer uh, a, a voter oppression more than the other because you can lose your right to vote. Mm -hmm. You can lose your right to education uh, as far as getting federal aid goes. Um, you can lose your right to housing, uh, despite the fact that maybe you're in treatment and remission. And so that's kind of how race uh, can intersect with the criminal justice system and a substance use disorder all at once and perpetuate health equalities. And I would suspect that some level uh, the availability of services as well is, is a factor. Absolutely, because you know, uh, structural wise and institution wise, um, the availability of treatment varies depending on different neighborhoods, the attitudes of the neighborhoods, and the resources in the neighborhoods as well. And um, I think that it's important to realize that uh, although the spread of the resources can vary, uh, the behavior itself doesn't always vary, but it can prolong the disorder and uh, increase in severity for different individuals more so, particularly of racial and ethnic minorities. Thank you. Uh, Michael, um, so let's talk about the impact of stigma. We've taken it to the family level. Talk to me about, or us, about the uh, discrimination uh, and stigma as it relates to communities and society. How does that manifest itself? So, you know, I think, you know, we talked about kind of the overwhelming criminal justice response, but, but, uh, but I also think that there are other kind of implications at both the kind of societal level and community level. And w one is, you know, one of the discriminatory practices that we've seen for a very, very long time is insurance discrimination uh, around both mental health and substance use disorders. And uh, really up until uh, our mental health and substance use parity laws and the Affordable Care Act, and we still have, I think, challenges with our insurance companies, both public and commercial, in terms of treating issues of addiction the same way we do with other uh, other medical conditions, um, but but you know uh, stigma exists at multiple levels, and we talked to kind of at the macro level and the family level and the uh, uh, kind of micro level, but 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 it also exists at the community level, and I you know I have a long history of doing this work as we've talk to mayors and communities about getting programs cited in their communities, you know, they often um, have this kind of sense of stigma, like, we are not citing this program here. We don't want this in our community. Uh, and it, the overwhelming, I think, uh, feeling is we're going to be attracting all of these people into our community um, and not necessarily acknowledging that um, there are people already in their community. Or this myth, myth, quite honestly, that <coughs> untreated addiction in their community, or that if they have a treatment program in the community, they're actually going to drive up crime versus all of the data that show that actually crime goes down in community. So, you know, I think it's become a really big, I think times have changed a little bit. Um, and I think communities, uh, because they've experienced the impact of the opioid epidemic at the community level, but, but this not in my backyard uh, practice has, I think, come up. And I think we've seen many communities try to implement kind of um, 
illegal zoning requirements around treatment programs. So, so I think it's really hampered, one, a community to acknowledge that they have a problem, um, and two, thinking about particularly community resources and how do we localize resources in their community. And it's all fear about, I think, attracting people, um, uh, not acknowledging that people with addiction are already in their communities, but somehow they're going to be attracting and become a magnet uh, for, you know, for people from outside the community. Ken, you, are, you have studied the whole issue of medication-assisted therapy, and we had previously had a brief conversation related to not in my backyard. Right. So uh, in Buffalo, there was a lot of, of um, uh, one of the, the agencies want to move, um, create a methadone clinic in one of the suburban areas. And there was a lot of pushback, and, and the fear was that they would be bringing people in from outside the area, and and, and it, it it fit in with sort of the the caricature of what a person with a substance use problem was, and not recognizing, as Michael said, that that they really are servicing people in their community, and and um, so it's a it tends to be a real short sighted kind of perspective, and. Um, it, and the data, as you, as you mentioned, is, is just absolutely on target, that it, it does not increase crime and tends to decrease it. But, you know, uh, John, as both Michael and Ken just mentioned, there are communities that basically bear down and say, not in my backyard, media covers it. So it further exacerbates the whole issue of stigma and discrimination because the other communities say, well, they're not coming over here. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that the case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, as, as Michael and, and Ken have mentioned, you know, it's, uh, it's this NIMBY issue and, and uh, they perceive it, it will attract crime, attract unattractive perceptions to their neighborhood. Um, it's and how do we shift this then? Well, Let's start talking yeah. about solutions. Yep. Let's start talking about how then do we uh, begin mm -hmm. to dissect, we've already dissected, but mm -hmm. let's start now in, in, in finding ways in which we need to deal with this and, and make uh, the change. Other than doing SAMHSA webinars? Other yeah, than yeah, doing yeah, SAMHSA yeah, webinars. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So the, <laughs> but the um, you know, I just want to amplify a point that Michael made, which is very interesting that licensed alcohol outlets, which people are generally often in favor of, that's correlated with increased <laughs> crime. Right. Increased crime mm -hmm. and unemployment and all the bad things that we think about with substance use is actually attributable not to treatment setting, as Michael pointed out, but rather to increasing licensed outlets for, uh, for sales of, of, you know, in that case, illegal drug alcohol. But, but uh, that coming is back the best to your kept point, secret. So how do we get that information and, out there? And there's lots of data, lots of very, very good data. And I think it's, again, we do a poor job in science from translating, I think, what we, what we have found scientifically into uh, public policy and then implementing it in the communities in which we live and suffer. Um, and uh, to our own detriment. And I, I think, you know, highlighting, uh, you know, what we're doing here is, you know, beginning the communication uh, dissemination of, of these ideas and, and the data out there. Um, uh, so through, through education, through understanding the nature of these conditions, what are they? You know, I think for the first time in the history of humankind, we understand now what is addiction. It's been documented for millennia. Ever since man has written down things, ever since we've had drugs that can be, uh, uh, that can um, hijack the, the, the reward pathway in the brain, uh, we've had documented cases in history. Uh, but now we understand really in the last 50 years exactly what's happening. So I think we're at a turning point in understanding and addressing these issues. But we have to uh, get the information out. You're, you're so right in, in bringing that up because we do, we, we've got so much science that now is accumulating. And I think now there's, there's a kind of a wave that will come as we start to translate and disseminate that yeah. information. And, you know, so we reached a point, we reached a point where every profession is going to be interacting with people who have substance use problems. And so it's incumbent on every profession to have some background in, in addiction science. And, and so having undergraduates have that exposure, have criminal justice majors have that exposure, um, social work, nursing, biomedical engineering, all those groups, 
um, and, and thinking about the way you can build an educational form, format for, um, at least for college um, and, and for professional schools that will get the science of addiction out there will go a long way to minimizing stigma. Yeah. But you know, I'm going to tell you, and I'm coming to you, Michael, so uh, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you, you know, when you were at ONDCP, you took a look at language, for example. And there are definite terms that ought not to be used about people who will have a, a substance use disorder problem and those that are in recovery. What are they? Where can people get information related to this? Beyond the language use, what other components are there that we can begin to look at specifically uh, for individuals, both clinicians, uh, uh, counselors, and just anyone beyond the field, uh, uh, what do we need to change? So, so uh, a couple things, and um, no offense to my research friends to my left and right, um, but science and data don't change people's minds. If it did, we wouldn't be debating climate change, we wouldn't be talking about immunizations, and I'm not saying, but um, often what changes people's minds are emotions. And, and, and let me just be brief and tell you a story. When I was living in Washington, I lived in a quickly gentrifying neighborhood in Capitol Hill. Uh, we had a neighborhood blog, and all of a sudden people in the blog started chiming in because an addiction treatment program was expanding around the corner, and there was all of the stuff that we're talking about, right? You know, we're going to be NIMBY. NIMBY issues coming. And I'm watching it go by, and I'm thinking, okay, do I weigh in here? I do this for a living. And, and I did, and I, I didn't disclose my job, but I said, look, um, I'm in recovery. I know there are other people on this block that are in recovery. The true facts are that untreated addiction drive crime, and, um, and I think it changed the, the attitude. And I think some of that was not just the data, but the fact that I disclosed to my neighbors that, that I was living on their block. Yeah. And, and so I think you know, we can't underestimate the power of knowing someone in terms of changing people's attitudes and beliefs. We did it with HIV, we did it with LGBT issues, that, that we change people's hearts and minds. Tobacco. I think, tobacco, when they know us, right? And, and part of that, I think that change, um, and, and again, I really wanna give Dr. Kelly a lot of credit for really helping us to understand the power of language in, in how we perceive people. And, you know, um, for a very long time, uh, you know, we refer people as addicts and junkies, substance abusers. You know, we often talk about people in recovery as being clean, um, when the, you know, we, obviously intuitive what the issue is. And, and, and we've learned from research that that has a direct impact on our view, even among clinicians, um, uh, on this issue. So, so there is tremendous, so this is not just a polite thing to do. This is a clinically uh, um, important, and also I think, from a public attitude perspective, that changing our language um, becomes really important, and 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 you know I think we've made some major changes and and advancements uh, around this. So I think many people are familiar with the AP style book, which is what uh, journalists mm -hmm, use to mm -hmm, report. Absolutely. Uh, I don't think the New York Times has gotten the memo yet, Dr. <laughs> Kelly. Um, but they've even sent out a call to journalists about using clinically appropriate, non-stigmatizing language because we know um, that that has a direct impact on public attitudes, on clinical interactions, and also, and I'll say this as a person in recovery, it affects your own attitudes mm -hmm. and your own beliefs about whether or not you deserve care. Yeah. One of the interesting things that's, that's happened um, in, in a lot of communities, and particularly in Buffalo, has been that with this opioid epidemic is everybody knows somebody who's lost somebody. And so the, the point you make about knowing that people are there, knowing that, that, this, is, that this is not just a, a small problem in a small area is happening. And, and I think the idea of sort of combining that, that experience with the education is where we'll be going. Yeah. Yeah. John, I better be careful because I'm sure there are doctors and clinicians out there, but how can... Could they potentially be part of, of the issue and the problem as well in terms of stigma and discrimination, if not Clinicians trained. are people too. Clinicians <laughs> are people too. <laughs> they are, and uh, yes, and, and therefore they are susceptible also to these biases 
and, and and part of it, you know, when it's not your, you know, your, not your game, it's not your day job doing serving people with addiction and mental health. You tend not to be as clued in. I'm not, I don't know much about heart disease or diabetes or these other conditions because that's not what I do. So I need more education if I were to address if they were stigmatized condition. And so you know, we we need to do a better job of educating our clinicians, again, as to the nature of our condition, Michael mentioned, you know, personal witness. So when they know somebody, when they see somebody, when they experience somebody who's in recovery, we've got 23 million people in recovery from a substance use disorder in this country walking around the streets out there. You don't know it because they're, you know, they're hidden. They're the anonymous people. But there's been a movement uh, of disclosure, of, of people disclosing, if they feel comfortable doing that, to be able to, to decrease that stigma. So personal witness of being saying, you know, I'm a person in long-term recovery, and then having that, oh, wow, you don't look like a, an alcoholic or an addict, right? You don't, you don't fit the stereotype. It breaks those stereotypes that people have when, when, you, when you're exposed to that personal witness. Education, and there is another factor that we've talked about, and, 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 and language. So educating clinicians, because we, we're not aware how, and we don't intend it. Here's the thing, with, we think with terms that are objectionable, we found to be objectionable from systematic research that actually can induce implicit cognitive biases against people with these mm -hmm. conditions. And all that does is that it stymies their treatment access, it helps them drop out of treatment sooner, and they, get into, and they don't get into recovery as quickly. Helping clinicians understand the power of language, the power of what they say, so they can use the right terms. And thanks to people like Michael and his leadership and other people um, have really uh, championed this, that we need to shift our language to be conducive and reflective of what we've learned about addiction as diseases, as disorders. And that's why we have adopted language such as substance use disorder. For example, I mean, and I'm going on here, but let me just one, okay. one thing. Yeah, like, uh, that's good. Uh, <laughs> but um, when people with eating-related problems are uniformly described as having an eating disorder, never as food abusers. And yet, when people have a substance-related condition, we often refer to them as substance abusers, not as having a substance use disorder. Interesting that, isn't it? Now, why is that? Why would we refer to people with eating-related conditions as having an eating disorder and not as food abusers? Right? Think about it. It rolls off the tongue. We don't even think about it. We just say, oh, I'm working in the eating disorders field, or yeah, this person has an eating disorder. We don't even think about it. That is habit. Language is habitual, and we have to learn new habits. We drop old language all the time in favor of new language, both through economy, as we want to have say the same thing and more economically, but also because things we we understand that things are stigmatized and we need to shift our language. Very good. Michael, I want to come back to you because I think that people in recovery, the 23 million <laughs> that you talked about themselves, I think have a role to play in the way we change language. I, I, a lot of them call themselves, I'm this, I'm not going to repeat it, but I'm this or I'm that or I'm the other. And, and I think that also even though sometimes it may be done in a, as a joke or, 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 you know, however it's done, yeah. is it a fact? It is. And I, 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 again, think I think people in recovery, and I'll, I'll just speak for myself, I, I think I have a particular responsibility as a public person in recovery to not use what I call my inside language in outside venues. What, what, what I might call another friend in recovery among ourselves or in the context of a 12-step mm -hmm. meeting is dramatically different than the language I should be using in public settings. And I think those of us in recovery, I think, have to understand the role that langu language plays in the general public and, and I think really be conscious about um, kind of the, the, you know, there's always been this difference between if you're part of a subgroup, you have some special rights about the language that you use, mm -hmm. but that you shouldn't be using it in broader context and in, in, in public settings. So, so I do think those of us in recovery have a particular obligation to make sure that we are, are using that kind of appropriate language in, in, in public settings. I think it, it's really important for us to be able to do that. And I think that will get to the issue of how then we help individuals who feel that overwhelming shame about their condition perhaps be able to, to approach uh, uh, someone to get assistance, correct? So in general, how can providers, let's talk a little bit about how can providers uh, help individuals who have uh, a substance use disorder uh, problem and, and have tremendous shame get over that in order to, to be able to appreciate better the dynamics of, uh, of, of the treatment process and, and seek help? 
Well, I think it, it begins with the language that the, that the practitioner uses with them and, and their overall approach. The, one of the things that we know that is, that's most effective in terms of uh, helping pers people with these kind of problems is developing a really good therapeutic relationship with them. And that has to do with kind of accepting where they are and, and um, using the, the, uh, the language that we've been talking about, the, the non-discriminatory language, and, and working with them on a series of, of, of mutually agreed on tasks to get them where mm -hmm. they want to go. So that entire therapeutic relationship is a, is a fundamental part of what we expect will help people. Yep. I, I want to chime in here because, you know, one of the things, Boston Medical Center, we have about 7,000 employees. And one of the things that we did for Recovery Month is we actually sent out a Words Matter pledge to all of our employees from our CEO um, that said, as a clinician and as an institution whose mission it is to treat people with dignity and respect, we're taking a pledge uh, to, to make sure that we are using clinically appropriate, non-stigmatizing language. Um, that uh, is actually on our website. We love for people to download it and use it in their own institutions. And, and I think it has a dual effect. I think it sends a message to our clinical community that people with substance use disorders deserve to be treated with clinic, uh, uh, dignity and respect, as well as kind of reinforcing non-stigmatizing language. And, and so I think, I think employers have a huge role to play, um, I think, in, in, in changing a culture and climate with their employees um, that this is a really important issue that we want to support you um, because we know it's fear of kind of what employers are going to think that often uh, I think factor into someone's ability to ask for help. John, how do we get providers, clinicians, physicians to better understand addiction so that their own biases are addressed? One is continuing education credits. So making continuing education um, in this area a part of their, uh, what they've got to do mm -hmm. each year and, and you know, make it a performance me measure as it were in terms of, of their uh, uh, Are criteria. you working currently with, with some entities in this regard? Yes, yes, we, we, that's, what we, that's what we are doing at Massachusetts General Hospital. Okay. So we are, we are working to, to, that, to that end to, to educate the, um, uh, the, the workforce in all the clinicians. Uh, are the you doing it um, uh, system-wide? Yes, yes. So, so the top strategic priority of the Massachusetts General Hospital is substance use disorder. That was declared about three or four years ago now. So the number one priority of our general hospital is addiction, the substance use disorder. Now why is that? Of course, these are endemic health problems as well Very as public health too. problems. Mm -hmm. That's right. So um, they are, uh, uh, they, they cluster into expensive healthcare utilization mm -hmm. also because they contribute, exacerbate, undermine the efficacy of our treatments of whatever else we try to do if someone um, is using alcohol or other drugs. So we need to address that. And that was you know, very clear from the data that was gathered uh, several years ago. And that's why it's recognized as top, pro the top, pro public, top health priority excuse me, of, of the hospital. There are many things that are being done. There's a whole new initiative uh, which is spearheaded um, in medicine where we are trying to educate, disseminate information where we have recovery coaches that are linking general medicine patients who have uh, a substance use disorder or substance related conditions to recovery coaches that they can link them to other services in the community in the hospital and hospital wide system. Ken, anything to add? Any, anything new that other, other uh, medical entities are doing or, or medical schools to I, address uh, well, this issue? So I think we're all sort of on the same page with, with regard to that. I think that there is um, a, a burgeoning interest in that. I know in New York State they, that there has been uh, movement to make sure that all physicians get at least four hours of, of um, training in opiate uh, prescribing. It's a small step, but it's a step in the, in the right direction. It's something that other states have not done and something that other states ought to do. Um, so I, I think that it's, it's part of a wave, and I think we'll see more of that. But how do we, basically, obviously, uh, we have some of the research, and I love the way that you characterized it. Research does not change necessarily 
in and of itself behaviors. How do we begin then to establish the policies, either by, reg I don't want to say the bad word of regulation, but, but statutes, or, or how do we begin to really talk about what Michael was, uh, was saying, is, is taking the research, taking it one step further, and really begin to tackle it? Because obviously, uh, if, if I'm a psychiatrist and I'm not trained in addiction medicine and I've been treating an alcoholic, who's bipolar for two years, and all of a sudden, you know, he realizes, oh, well, I'm not trained in, in addiction medicine, uh, really uh, continues to promote a, a, a vicious circle, because unless that addiction is, is dealt with, so what do we need to do? Well, so as a psychologist, I think that, that the, the psychology programs ought to make it um, a, a major requirement that people have, that people are coming out with a clinical degree, clinical psychology, counseling psychology, have a certain number of hours in, in addiction and they begin to understand how to deal with that. Our Division 50, is, John is a recent past president of that, has been uh, in the forefront of of making sure that, that those kinds of expertise are available in psychology. And I think that the, um, we should be seeing similar kinds of things in medicine. Yeah. You know, one of the things that John talked about I think is particularly important as we really look at changing our healthcare delivery system, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think there has been a greater focus, both MGH and Boston Medical Center are now embarking on new accountable care organizations where we have to basically, we are responsible now for all of the patient's outcomes and costs. Yeah. And I think our healthcare delivery systems are really coming to an acute understanding, mm -hmm. as, as John talked about, that many people with untreated substance use disorders and mental health issues are some of our biggest cost drivers. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually think that that is really kind of elevating these issues within many of our healthcare delivery systems because they're understanding we have to do a better job of diagnosing and treating people with substance use disorders because we're not gonna curb, we're not gonna bend the cost curve unless we are focusing on that population. And so I think as we think about um, uh, changing the way our healthcare delivery system uh, uh, treats issues of addiction that we, we can make some sus substantial progress. And, and the other piece too is I think uh, around performance indicators that, that we really have to I think embed these kinds of performance indicators um, with, within our healthcare delivery system because people do what they're measured on. That's um, right. And then the training and all the other stuff follows it. So, so I think we've got to align our fin uh, financial incentives in our healthcare delivery system to do a better job at identification and engagement and treatment. So I guess we wait another 20 years? No, I think it's happen. happening now in Massachusetts and other places around the country <laughs> where, where we are seeing, you know, uh, I think a more uh, uh, laser focus on issues of substance use in our healthcare delivery system. Yeah. I think so. so John, it's, no, and it's unignorable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's gone to the point. And, and, and take us through in closing, what was the, the motivator mm -hmm. for Mass General Hospital, one of the top, if not the top, hospital in the country? Those of us at Boston Medical Center. Yeah, well, disagree. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, take us through what, what were the factors that really uh, allowed for ad addictions and substance use disorders to come to the forefront mm -hmm. in, the, in the hospital? Well, one was surveying communities. So our community centers were surveyed. What are the biggest problems in your, uh, health, problem, health problems in your, in your communities? Number one, substance use disorder. Go figure. It's been the number one public health problem for the last That's 20, right. 30 years, maybe longer. So what they communicated back to, you know, uh, Central CO was that um, was the uh, was was substance use disorder that was the top factor affecting communities. So recognizing that the economic factors, the moral factors, you know, just the fact you you can't ignore this. You know, there's 63,000 people, new people dying of overdoses. Mm -hmm. That's 60. That's a thousand new families who are bereaved every single week. New families that are bereaved. So this is unignorable now. Uh, we've got 100,000 alcohol-related deaths a year. This is an un unignorable. We can't ignore this any longer. Every single day in the media, um, we see, we hear about it because every family, you know, if it's not them, they know a family that has, has suffered this kind of bereavement and loss, which is so tragic because these are preventable conditions. And 
Um, and so I think we are at an, at an age now and at a time in our, in our history where in middle and high income countries where we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm -hmm. You know, we're recognizing that as a society, you know what, we don't like this stuff, but we have to address it. That's what people, I think, are coming around to see. Yeah, okay, we've tried to ignore it for, for so long, but now we know what, this is such on our, in our face now, we have to deal with it. And this is good news. I think it's good news for people who are suffering from it, families who are suffering. Very good. So, Michael, in closing, if mm -hmm. I'm in the audience and I work for a medical center or I work for an entity, how do, how do we um, uh, begin to lay the groundwork for people to begin to deal with issues of stigma and discrimination? What, what ought the steps be in order for that to happen? Well, you know, I think John uh, and Ken hit the, the nail on the head that um, I think that because of how personal this issue is for folks, that, that that's our opportunity, I think, to engage in stakeholders in a meaningful discussion about what they can do. Um, and I think we're seeing people, and quite honestly, unlikely partners who are willing to kind of step forward and do this. And I think those of us who've been doing this work for a long time, I think what our job is, is to then provide for them the solutions uh, for, for, for what they need to do. And, and I think, again, uh, you know, whether you're uh, a medical institution, whether you're a faith community, whether you're an employer, um, whether a community organization, I think that um, uh, uh, how we uh, talk about this in a much more open fashion, um, I, uh, again, I think that we need to continue to support people in recovery and challenge them to be open about uh, who they are, because I, I do think that that changes the conversation. Okay, so we have uh, time for a couple of questions. Thinking about substance use disorders from a public health perspective, what role do panelists think the criminal justice system should play in addressing substance use problems to maximize the pipeline to problem resolution while minimizing stigma? And we'll start with John and go all the way through. Well, I think Michael uh, d described that a little bit earlier, alluded to this issue of the power of the criminal justice system to do good. So what they call therapeutic jurisprudence. In other words, using kind of common sense factors to understand what is the root, what is the driver of the crime. And I think there's been increasing recognition that a large part of the driver of the crime, why they're standing in front of the judge, is because it's driven by an addiction, by a substance-related condition or substance use disorder. So now there's been the growth in drug courts. Again, diversion into treatment as opposed to a punitive measure, which is largely ineffective in changing behavior. So if we can get people more um, into treatment, the criminal justice is fantastic at, at using that leverage to get, as Michael described uh, in his own case, to get people into treatment. And when they get into treatment, we find re regardless of how people arrive in treatment, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, they tend to have uh, as good, if not better, outcomes. I think we've seen a, begun to see a sea change in uh, local law enforcement response to this issue. And, you know, I don't know how many times I've heard local law enforcement say we can't arrest and incarcerate our way out of this problem, um, which is really amazing. And I think we've seen the extraordinary uptake of naloxone distribution by law enforcement. We've seen programs start um, where uh, they're actually encouraging people to come into mm -hmm. uh, agencies, uh, law enforcement agencies. Um, and get people into care. I think that we've seen um, uh, 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 police departments that are doing post-overdose intervention programs. So, so, so those of us on the public health side, if we haven't already, I think we've got, we have an extraordinary opportunity to reach out to our public safety partners. I, I will have to say, without being overtly political, that I am really um, discouraged when I hear the rhetoric coming from uh, the president, coming from our attorney general, in kind of pivoting back to a very heavy-handed and harsh penalty because I think many, many law enforcement people have already made the shift away from those approaches. Anything to add, Ken? I think we should go on to the next question. Next question, those, okay. Those Leveraging this understanding what exposure uh, do people in recovery uh, might have uh, in terms of changing the perception and stigma. How can we use that to inform media advocacy campaigns that would reach lots of people at once? 
Uh, how mm. might that look like in reality, and how might it affect someone? Uh, John, are media campaigns helpful? They can be uh, if they're done right. Uh, so it's a, it's a good thought. Uh, is, could we do a public health campaign to uh, help people understand just how prevalent recovery is, how most people who have a substance use disorder get into remission? I think a lot of people have a very negative view because all they hear is the bad news uh, on the radio mm -hmm. every, every day or on in TV about overdose deaths and how hopeless it is, and, and of course that draws in people, it, it, it sucks in people to, to those TV stations, but, but it, I think if you, if you frame it right and, and, and get it out, and there's lots of social marketing psychology that can uh, address and help people to design positive media campaigns that can help destigmatize and, and help us talk. I know for a fact that I know that the SAMHSA uh, uh, public service announcements really drive people to call for assistance. Yeah, uh, yeah. We don't have specific numbers, but we know that the numbers calling each month were averaging, you know, 40, 50,000 people calling in. So it's, it's there may be uh, some, some benefits. The, the state of Massachusetts, I had nothing to do with it, has this a really wonderful anti-stigma campaign. It's called the State Without Stigma. Mm. Um, oh. but, but I think this is an area that's ripe for additional research mm. in terms of particularly messages around addiction. What messages actually will change people's minds? And, and I think that that's um, an area, like we certainly know that personal contact does, but I do think it's an area of kind of what specific messages mm. or told by what people Right. And in what way, mm -hmm. you know, what are the messages that really change people's minds? We have about one minute. Can Dr. Vilsan talk a little bit about the idea of double discrimination? So potentially how being discriminated uh, as an ethnic racial minority and as an individual with substance use disorder might be worse than either one together. So double discrimination is a topic that's out there in the research literature, absolutely. Whether it be from being a sexual minority, uh, a racial minority, as well as being part of a stigmatized population in recovery. And uh, there are intersections. There are definitely intersections where you can see how perhaps the criminal justice system has had more of a heavy hand in dealing with substance use disorder with racial and ethnic minorities. And I think that's an example of experiencing double discrimination. Uh, from a scientific perspective, I can tell you it's going to be, it's very hard to parse apart. We do our best. It's very hard to capture. We design measures that try to bring out racial discrimination from the experiences of discrimination related to recovery. Uh, but at the same time, empirically, those things are very difficult to capture despite the fact that we see them happening. Very good. Thank you so much. And that's all the time we have for today. Uh, a big thank you to our wonderful panelists and a big thank you to all our viewers who tuned in today to learn about the stigma and discrimination of substance use disorders. Please visit the SAMHSA website at SAMHSA.gov for more information on this webcast, including a taped version of the broadcast and resources that some of which we discussed today. Join us again for our next webcast in the series on Thursday, April 26th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we will talk about why addiction is a disease and why it's important. We look forward to seeing you then.